Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our event today. My name is Tommy Vettacolel. I am a 3L here at the University of St. Thomas Law School. I'm very excited to welcome you to our Murphy Institute event this afternoon. The Murphy Institute is a collaboration between the Center for Catholic Studies and the School of Law that works to engage the Catholic intellectual tradition and the practice of the legal prof profession together in a way that creates meaningful discussions and debates on the law and public policy through the lens of Catholic contemporary perspectives. After Professor De Girolami's pr presentation, there will be time for some Q&A. For those looking to get CLE credit for this presentation, please visit the table right outside of the classroom um, and make sure you sign your name and your license number to make sure you can get that credit. For my individuals that are eating lunch in here as well, if you wouldn't mind um, disposing of your trash outside of the classroom when you are done, this is to aid our custodians without having to come into the room. They can just um, get rid of the trash once they are outside of the classroom as well. It is my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Professor Mark J. Girolami, St. John's University from the St. John's University School of Law. He is the Carey Fields Professor of Law and the co-director for the Center of Law and Religion at St. John's University. His publications include The Tragedy of Religious Freedom and various articles in the Yale Law Journal, Notre Dame Law Review, Boston College Law Review, among others. He also has written for the New York Times, The New Republic, Commonweal, and various other publications. He is currently working on a book project on traditionalism in constitutional interpretation. The professor will be discussing the history of the field of religion and law. This includes topics such as the nature of religion and the secular in the law and the implications for law and religion as an independent academic discipline. With an ever-changing world and with the passing and retirement of many great scholars, what does this future look like for the field? To give us that answer, please welcome Professor De Girolami. Um, thanks very much, uh, Tommy. That was uh, very nicely uh, presented, and it's a pleasure for me to be back here at the University of St. Thomas. It's probably been, oh, I would say at least five or six years since I've been back, just thinking about it and seeing my friend Lisa Schiltz uh, here. I want to thank uh, uh, Greg Sisk and Michelle Rash for um, uh, organizing all of this. Um, I want to start with a little bit of professional uh, melancholy, as Tommy mentioned, the year has seen a number of giants in the field of law and religion either pass away, as in the case of Professor Steve Schifrin, or one of my own mentors, uh, Professor Kent Greenewald, uh, or retire, as have uh, uh, Professors uh, Douglas Laycock, Stephen Smith, uh, Gerald Bradley, um, it's a sad occasion, I think, but it's also an occasion to reflect on what first motivated this field, law and religion, to emerge. An occasion to remember law and religion's birth and life. Um, law and religion as an independent discipline in American law and scholarship is a new a newcomer by comparison with fields like courts or contracts or criminal law or property, and even 19th and 20th century uh, 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 arrivals like bankruptcy law and administrative law. Um, it's largely a creature of the 1980s, springing up roughly contemporaneously with other law and fields like law and economics, law and race, law and sociology, law and literature, and so on. Um, law and, and, and religion seem like they ought to be a natural match. They share many foundational ideas, trespass, uh, duty or obligation, covenant, intention, free will, uh, culpability, objectivity, and subjectivity, and many, many more. Even the very idea of doctrine and its development is of central importance. Uh, in the Western legal experience, Law and religion interpenetrated one another deeply, uh, as in the ecclesiastical and canon law courts of Europe, as well as the profound and enduring influence of Christianity on the common law. Um, and yet, for the last quarter of the 20th century, there was no law and religion uh, discipline. And the question is, why? Why not? 
Well, the soil of uh, the American legal terrain for most of the 20th century was not hospitable to a law and religion field. The view that law was an autonomous discipline, a science whose outputs were a matter of purely human prediction, was shored up by the impregnable wall thought to separate law from religion. All of the differences between somebody like a, a Christopher Columbus Landell, early dean of Harvard Law School, uh, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, both could agree that religion had no place in the study of law. Um, uh, as Professor John Witte has put it, quote, for Holmes, the path of the law cut a horizontal line uh, uh, between heaven and hell, between human sanctity and depravity. Law served to keep society and its members from sliding into the abyss of hell, but it could do nothing to guide its members in the ascent to heaven, close quote. Um, so Holmes and those who followed him that to believe that to become truly modern, law would need systematically to slough off the old moral concepts um, uh, that ultimately depended upon religious ideas and that had shaped it and usually expressly Christian ideas. Law would have to abjure and separate itself from its Western religious inheritance. And most of the 20th century was dominated by similar and largely unquestioned separationist assumptions in the law and scholarship of church-state relations. You had Thomas Jefferson's wall of separation metaphor adopted by the Supreme Court in 1947 and really representing the court's predominant approach to interpreting the religion clauses until about the mid 80s. Um, the core scholarly and judicial objective when it came to church state matters, to the extent there was one, was essentially applied Holmes um, to destabilize and in time discard the widely acknowledged religious inheritance. The Supreme Court's project was to dismantle bit by bit the soft Christian establishment that had dominated the cultural landscape. Um, separationism was exemplified in the court's 1971 uh, case, Lemon versus Kurtzman, but really was the dominant approach, as I've mentioned before and after that. And so by the mid 80s, the success of this demolition project changed things and in many ways was responsible for creating the first generation of true law and religion scholars. And the predominant work of this scholarship and this discipline responded in various ways to a new problem that had two faces. Number one, the problem of increasing religious pluralism in the United States. And number two, the civic void that the Supreme Court and other powerful actors had created by progressively dismantling the old establishment. Um, if there's one word to describe this work, I think it would be theory. The new work of law and religion scholarship wanted to impose some descriptive or evaluative order on the increasingly wild disorder of American religious pluralism. It was now thought necessary to make sense of the religion clauses, by the way, something that had never been thought necessary before in a way that could make sense of the aims of the American polity, whatever those might be. And the terms of the debate were set according to broadly liberal understandings. By that, I mean, these scholars prized the sovereignty of the individual, uh, uh, the priority of autonomous choice in matters of religion, the absolute equality of any single individual to any other when it comes to matters of religious choice. And if not necessarily the hermetic division between uh, the public sphere of government and the private sphere of religion, which some did support, um, then at least rigorous government neutrality as to religion as a public communal civic endeavor. Major figures of the period, including Greenewald, Schifrin, Laycock, Vincent Blasey, Jesse Chopra, and others came of age during this period and all theorized American church-state relations in various ways from this liberal baseline, so accepted uh, 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 and so defined. Um, the aim was to conceive a liberal theory of religious freedom and church-state relations that made sense of an increasingly fragmenting and disunited polity. 
all of these scholars were in some measure favorable to government accommodation for the increasing pluralism uh, of new and exotic religious phenomena. But traditional Christianity was never on the agenda since all strongly supported disestablishmentarian, the disestablishmentarian dismantling that came before and was continuing and gathering spe uh, steam. All were confident that the great minds of the American past, principally Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, since nobody else was really ever mentioned, um, were on board in spirit with this dual strong, strong view of disestablishment and free exercise. Um, there was overwhelming consensus on these basics. Number one, the firm conceptual definitional separation between the religious and the secular. Number two, the importance of rigorous state neutrality toward, if not strict separation from, particular religious traditions and religion generally, and the essential correctness of the Supreme Court's de-Christianizing uh, jurisprudence. And third, the advisability of, and sometimes the positive constitutional demand for, religious exemption from general laws to accommodate the welcome fact of religious pluralism. This was the largely unquestioned creed of the scholars of the first wave. Um, it was the great bargain of the era. This uh, will give you, we'll, we'll, we'll sign on for religious accommodation on condition that we continue the de-Christianizing disestablishmentarian work. Um, uh, and it was, it was the way in which the great theories of religious freedom of these new scholars of law and religion flowered. Um, as the field developed, each of these three pillars of the first wave of scholarship began to crumble and the field to lose coherence. The field that is began to die. Uh, often enough, the pressures that brought about the collapse of the discipline, uh, the collapse of the consensus were internal to the first wave's ambition to impose order on the disorder of pluralism, to reconstruct some kind of substitute along liberal foundations to, to fill the emptiness following the deconstructed political establishment. Um, the first death was of the word, and the word was religion. The steady degradation in the legal meaning of religion was effectuated by a kind of pincer movement of disestablishmentarian and accommodationist doctrine. Establishment clause law had broken up the soft Christian establishment of America's past, but free exercise would have a role too. Religion was no longer to be conceived as a substantive system of common belief and practice, but as an individual preference, hopefully an ephemeral changing one, but certainly one that, in the words of one Supreme Court decision, quote, need not be acceptable, logical, consistent, or comprehensible to anybody but the individual claimant, close quote, and perhaps not even to him or her. Unacceptable, illogical, inconsistent, Incomprehensible. These are not words that one typically associates with desirable human phenomena <laughs> worthy of preservation and constitutional or other legal protection. But that is what religion in American law became. Running alongside these doctrinal developments have been sc uh, powerful scholarly attacks on religion's distinctiveness as a constitutional right. Now, there are differences among them, but all say religion is reducible to other rights that don't depend on the label, on the designation religion or religious and hold equivalent moral status. I'm not going to get into the details of those arguments, though I will say it should come as little surprise that religion grew vulnerable to accusations of non-distinctness once it had been voided of substance. Instead, what I'm interested in is the some of the responsive scholarly apologies for religion proceeding from liberal premises and the highly defensive posture they tend to assume. So, for example, uh, Professor Christopher Lund, friend of mine, uh, but I'm going to go after him here, insists that while religion in the modern American state is highly susceptible to claims of indistinctness, it is at least no more indistinct than many other rights. It's special enough not to be discarded together uh, 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 altogether as an anachronism. So the great defense of religion in this 
in this account that every right is this way so that at least we can console ourselves in religion's non-distinct non-distinctness is not only weak as a defense, but also unpersuasive because it doesn't account for the gigantic gaping hole at the center, at the dead center of religion's legal meaning. Contrast, for example, the freedom of speech. It's true that like religion, we often contest what speech is at the margins. Maybe we debate about new dancing or spending money or something like that. But nobody contests speech's central meaning. Nobody doubts that political speech in a park or printed in a newspaper opinion column is speech protected by the First Amendment. And nobody says that speech is what any sincere but deluded person believes or wants it to be on one day, but that it changes in response to differently sincerely held delusions, maybe the same persons, on the next. So the centrality of certain beliefs or tenets, one might have thought, is of the essence of what religion is. Nope, not under the chief federal statute protecting religious freedom. Religion in law is now nothing and everything. It is nothing because it has no essence, no system, no communal content, no substantive content at all. And it is everything because it depends entirely on the vagaries of individual choice and is as changeable as the flights of human fancy and imagination, albeit a decidedly low-grade, uh, uh, wishy-washy kind of imagination. Now, now, one interesting byproduct of the first wave theoretical project to liquefy religion into a kind of sincerely held nothingness was the collapse or the knocking down of the wall of separation, because the wall of separation could stand at least somewhat firm when there was a clearly articulable difference between religion and non-religion, a this and a that that could be pointed to. And maybe uh, that difference couldn't always be articulated at a conceptual level, but there was at least one fixed socio-cultural reality that scholars and judges could point to as exemplifying religion. The soft Christian establishment and its fruits in public school prayer, parochial school non-funding, state-sponsored religious displays, blue laws, official state expressions and phrases, religious organizations like hospitals and orphanages that performed civic functions and worked together with the state, so on. But once that establishment had been demolished and once what, once what remained was only the brute fact of religious pluralism, a division between the realm of private belief and choice, religion, and the realm of public, right, or I should say the wall, right, the, this division between uh, uh, what religion was and what the secular was, was sort of washed away in the flood. Um, so that's number one. The second, the second decaying pillar of the first wave of scholarship was the insistence that the state should be neutral as to religion. Um, now, at first glance, separationism and neutrality are not the same thing, right? One aims to keep different things from mixing up with one another in separationism. The other requires neither endorsement nor disapproval of some other thing. But the approaches are not necessarily in conflict and, in fact, often complementary or maybe mutually entailing. Government is not neutral with respect to the subjects that it regularly addresses and sees within its proper ken. It's invested or comprehens comprehensively entangled in those matters. And virtually all scholars of law and religion's first wave agree that neutrality is a crucial, if not the key value to be promoted by the state as respects religion. Two principal developments have conspired to render neutrality a growing irrelevancy. Um, the first follows uh, from the death of religion as a useful legal concept, because if I'm right that religion in American law suffers from a kind of liquidation in which it is now nothing and everything, then it is impossible for the government to be neutral toward it. It would be like asking the government to be neutral toward politics, with this important exception that unlike political non-neutrality, religious non-neutrality can be invoked selectively in order to achieve some other type of purpose or make some other type of point. Those purposes and points concern the ideological or political content of the law, not its form or the ostensible grounds for it. Let me see if I can give a concrete example. 
consider one telling exchange in the oral argument in Dobbs, right, in which uh, the court ultimately, as I'm sure you all know, struck down the Roe versus Wade and Casey regime of abortion rights. Um, quote, how is your interest anything but a religious view, close quote? Justice Sotomayor asked this question for advocates of advocates of the state. Quote, the issue of when life begins has been hotly debated by philosophers since the beginning of time. It's still debated in religions. So when you say that this is the only right that takes away from the states the ability to protect a life, that's a religious view, isn't it? Close quote. Now notice, as a formal matter, Dobbs had nothing to do with the religion clauses. Nobody had argued that the Mississippi law uh, violated the establishment clause, for example. But Justice Sotomayor invokes religion in a different and subtler way, tactically, in order to portray the ideological or political content of the law as religiously motivated and therefore as illegitimate because non-neutral as to religion. But in the new dispensation, there is nothing that distinguishes the religious ground from the non-religious ground. That was the effect, if not the point, of liquefying religion. It was equally the effect, if not the point, of the successful attacks on religion's non-specialness. The result is a kind of arbitrary on-off switch quality to accusations of a religious non-neutrality that can be deployed to charge political views with which one disagrees of being illegitimate in form while insulating one's own views from similar charges. Second issue on neutrality, there's a dawning sense heightened by the increasing pluralism that it was the first wave's ambition to manage that neutrality is just empty as a law and religion ideal. Religious neutrality shows itself more and more unable to constitute a foundational political establishment. It can't substitute for the soft Christian establishment. Arguments that depend upon religious neutrality presuppose a broad consensus on shared non-religious civic commitments on what citizens agree on together as an acceptable basis for a kind of common civic enterprise. But the liquidation of religion hasn't resulted in the formation of a firmer civic consensus on the basics of the common American project. To the contrary, the hope that underneath all of the obvious and growing difference, there is some commonality that could be cooked up in a theorist lab and superimposed on a willing people has been shown to be a ludicrous fantasy. There is nothing common underneath. A third decaying, final decaying pillar of the first wave law and religion project is the conviction that there is a constitutional mandate for legislatures or failing that for courts to grant religious exemptions from generally and neutrally applicable laws to anybody who objects to them on the basis of sincere religious scruple. Religious exemption has served three basic functions. Number one, to destabilize the preceding political establishment by strengthening, strengthening the sense that religion is no longer about the American civic and social fabric, but instead essentially concerns the supplicant, the weak, the exotic, the non-threatening. Two, to assist further in the liquidation of, le of, of, the, of religion's legal meaning. And third, to attempt to forge a new American establishment on a foundation of pluralism. That project has been a mixed success, but its failure is most evident on the final element. Because over the last generation, religious exemption has become the single most contentious issue in law and religion, and it's not even close. Um, <clears throat> let me focus for a moment on exemptions political unsustainably. There are many problems with religious exemption. This is only one. It turns out, once again, that an instrument designed by the first wave to solve the problem of pluralism in America by creating some kind of alternative civic foundation, the foundation of a pluralistic autonomy inflected theory of quote unquote, religious freedom for all, close quote, has backfired. Rather than providing a new civic baseline, exemptions ascendancy has exacerbated conflict and abetted the dissolution of any residual civic commonality 
without offering anything plausible by way of replacement. On the doctrinal front, the rule, the formal rule of Employment Division versus Smith, right, that neutral and generally applicable laws and policies don't require exemption to comply with the free exercise clause that's still in place. But trouble for Smith has come in the court's most recent elaborations of religious exemption law in the COVID cases and in another case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. The COVID cases seem to require what supporters and critics have called a, quote, most favored nation, close quote, approach to religious exemption. That is, a law that regulates both secular and religious conduct and is therefore generally applicable demands strict scrutiny and therefore essentially requires exemption so long as it contains any exemptions that are thought by the judge to be comparable to a religious exemption. Fulton appeared to reinforce this approach and go a step further. Even the mere possibility in a law for the making of a non-religious exemption, whether a religious, whether an exemption had ever been made, is sufficient to trigger strict scrutiny. So the upshot of these cases is that strict scrutiny in response to a claim for exemption now seems required in virtually every conceivable real-world regulatory situation. The problem here is not, I want to emphasize, that exemptions will be doled out arbitrarily, let alone that religious minorities will not receive them in sufficient abundance. The problem is that the doctrine compels them to be given way too often. And that requirement will inevitably result in greater social and civic anger and alienation outside of Supreme Court doctrine. And it's a pity uh, Professor Tom Berg isn't here because now I'm gonna be going after him. You can tell him. Um, one will often hear that religious exemptions are required because we need quote, religious freedom for all, close quotes, so that the right of religious freedom is not seen by the public to be captured by a particular political or, or, or cultural constituency. Rhetorically appealing as that ideal might be to some people, it is doubtful that religious freedom for all is either a feasible or a desirable aspiration. If religious freedom for all means presumptively required exemption from neutrally and generally applicable laws for any claimant who has a sincere objection to them and under circumstances where the laws contain or even merely contemplate any other exemption, it is utterly unsustainable. And by unsustainable, I mean impossible to achieve if one wishes to continue to have a polity where the people share anything fundamental as American citizens. When the dissolution of religion as a coherent legal concept is combined with a demand for presumptive exemption from generally applicable law on that same basis, on that same vacant basis, you have the makings of a sort of political megaton bomb. It is difficult to see, to think of anything more destructive of the civic fabric and of any residual sense of commonality in American politics than a constitutional right not to obey the law for religious reasons under a set of legal conditions where religion has dissolved into a kind of gelatinous nothingness of personal political preference. Of course, demands for exemption can still be overridden if the state has a compelling interest that it is achieving by the least restrictive means, but under the most favored nation approach, the state's interest weakens the moment it exempts any comparable, any comparable activity to religion from its law. That stacks the deck in exemptions favor. And in fact, religious freedom for all as code for presumptive exemption has now become a key theater in which Americans wage sublimated political and cultural warfare against one another. Many of the COVID-19 fights illustrated this dynamic. Were churches like liquor stores, or were they more like movie theaters or, or museums, or maybe tattoo parlors? Or how physically proximate do religious congregants have to be from one another to be comparably dangerous to people in other venues for purposes of balancing the state's interest? <clears throat> Judges created categories, they, they drew lines reflecting mixed judgments, and nobody was happy. Scholars were quick to note the politically partisan results in these cases, but the most striking thing was the opposition of science and religion in the ideolo ideological lines of division. This was a kind of replaying of the conflict between reason and religion 
seen at least since the Enlightenment, right? Those who challenged the side of reason were accused of egotistically and irrationally preferring their religion to public health and welfare, and they were labeled anti-science Christians or dangerous Christian nationalists with a long and deeply rooted history of similar or irresponsible resistance. And those who resisted the cascade of COVID-19 edicts took the accusation that they were doing so on irrational religious grounds to heart. Um, right? It was just, it was exactly because religion was the only ground that you could resist the mandates, right? That, uh, uh, right, because, because the exemptions from the mandates might be allowed if your reasons were religious. Namely what? Namely the kind of reason that a person might have if they were not civically minded, public health oriented and patriotic, but instead irrational, selfish, retrograde, and anti-American. And so many dissenters began to see themselves that way as combatants, in a cultural and political war using language now labeled religious to express their view that what it meant to be an American was being rejected. One of the most recent developments in the religious freedom for all exemption culture war is the case of Jewish claimants who argue that the state burdens their religious freedom unless it exempts them from its restrictions on abortion. It's a synagogue in Florida that has argued that the state's new restrictions on abortion, right, whose legal status was fortified after Dobbs, violate the religious freedom protections in Florida's constitution, but they might as well have brought it under the federal constitution. So this is one more arena in which religious exemption serves as a fairly simple and direct proxy for cultural warfare. The issue is not, I hasten to add, sincerity. These plaintiffs are likely to survive an inquiry into the sincerity of their views about the desirability, the spiritual desirability of abortion. Rather, the problem is religious freedom for all interpreted it as a demand for exemption for anybody who is serious or sincere about wanting it is no way to run a democratic government that purports to abide by the rule of law. In all of these ways, in some, the concerns that motivated the first wave of law and religion scholarship and the solutions to the growing problem of pluralism that these scholars reached seem like those of a bygone era. They mattered when the country was a different country, but they are now largely bereft of scholarly interest. Now, to be sure, the First Amendment still mentions religion. The doctrine still retains some holdover neutralist and separationist language. Religious exemption is still all the rage in many senses, in constitutional and statutory case law, advocates on all sides are going to need to know how to wield these terms expertly as weapons in an ongoing of war for the soul of the nation. Judges will have to continue to use the old ideas, and scholars, I'm sure, for their part, will persist in recycling the same points that have been made on these tired matters, fighting the same fights in the way that we do over and over. But in my estimation, this is a waste of time. These issues are moribund. Law and religion is awaiting a kind of rebirth. Here are quickly, because I know I'm a little over, two, two subjects of inquiry that might begin to reanimate the field. Number one, the nature and life cycle of political establishment. And second, the coming of new expressions of dissent from them in new disestablishments. Consider first the idea of establishment. One of the less successful features of the first waves theorizing was to rebuild a new political establishment on the now vacant territory of the deconstructed soft Christian establishment. That reconstruction was to take place as scholars imagined it on the shifting sands of rampant religious and other pluralism. A new establishment is in fact, emerging, but it is questionable whether it is precisely the one that had been envisioned. Its tenets are rooted, at least in part, in identitarian commitments on sexuality, race, and intellectual class uh, um, uh, that are now championed by powerful political and cultural actors in both public and private institutions. In a more recent example that nicely illustrates how the dynamics of the emerging establishment operate, a federal district court in Arkansas struck down, in part on First Amendment grounds, the state's ban on gender transition procedures for children under the age of 18. The law would have prevented healthcare professionals from 
quote, altering or removing physiological or anatomical characteristics or features that are typical to the individual's biological sex, as well as, quote, instilling or creating physiological or anatomical characteristics that resemble a sex different from the individual's biological sex. Again, four minors. Arkansas presented extensive expert evidence from physicians, sociologists of science, so on, that the reasons supporting gender transition procedures were political or ideological in nature rather than medical or scientific. But that evidence was disregarded by the court because it was grounded, the court believed, in, quote, an impermissible religious doctrinal view, close quote, rather than a scientific medical view. But notice, this is an effective way to construct new establishments through the strategic deployment of neutrality as power play, as if the First Amendment was meant to destroy basic and commonly accepted assumptions about reality and allow state actors to impose new ones favored by alternative political and ideological frameworks. The preferred frameworks are just as, quote unquote, religious as the repudiated ones. How would they not be? after the work of the first wave. But whatever one's view of the right result in cases like these, it seems like a propitious moment for law and religious scholars to shift their energies from the older questions and instead focus on establishment, how establishment is constructed, how it is maintained, how it's defended, alongside the major matter of how new establishments come into being are related questions about how they are stabilized, how they are resisted. The life cycle of political establishment and disestablishment is fluid, changeable, even cyclical. An exemption is only one tool, not even a very good one, of resisting political establishment. Rather than continuing to focus on exemption, um, all right, in, 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 in phrases, catch slogans like religious freedom for all, um, law and religious scholars might take up the challenge of exploring how it is that strong and well-networked dissenting positions on bedrock civic creeds take root and become successful. Um, one prominent area that I'll, that I'll just mention is the new school choice. Um, you can hardly imagine a more entrenched feature of the core political American establishment than public or common school, which is is seen as one of the foundations of American civil and political life. And yet, as of, as of this talk, 12 states have near universal eligibility for school choice programs, opting out of compulsory public school education as the required mode of instructing uh, young people. There were none as of last summer. That cataclysm of change that is the new school choice movement reflects the deep mistrust and skepticism that many Americans now have of American institutions, especially educational ones. Um, and in the end, I think, of continued skepticism, of continued participation in the American polity. Right? So the problem for many Americans isn't so much public school, it's school or education in America. Um, so here, forget about religious exemptions here or there for some weak and non-threatening organization. It's disestablished disestablishmentarian movements and mechanisms like this one that are the engines of disruption, true political disruption. And it's those kinds of phenomena that ought to occupy the next wave of law and religion scholarship. One last thing. One question that could be put to my suggestion about these new possibilities is, OK, where is the religion? Um, the path that I've sketched for scholarship and new establishments and new disestablishments is about studying social movements and the exercise of power and resistance to it. But religion seems epiphenomenal to those projects. And that's true. And if that's true, then maybe law and religion hasn't been uh, uh, reborn so much as surpassed. It's a hard objection. It's in some ways a challenge to predict the latest response to a long running set of unsatisfactory responses to the collapse of Christendom in the West and the resulting chaos of pluralism. The wars of religion offered an unsatisfactory answer. The peace of Westphalia offered an unsatisfactory answer. The United States Constitution offered an answer 
and its graduated, complicated, and kind of intermediate solution might have worked, it might have sufficed, might even have endured, but it was either misunderstood or understood and repudiated by the church state scholars and law and religion theorists of the first wave, as well as the Supreme Court of the 20th century. Those powerful forces offered another answer, liquidated religion, secular neutrality, and religious freedom for all. That answer also has proved grossly inadequate and apologies for it are reaching exhaustion. What will follow, that the next response to the breakup of Christendom will be already seems to implicate law and religion in new ways. Thanks very much. Bit, but uh, but I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions, concerns, field any rotten tomatoes uh, that may be thrown, anything else that you have on your mind. It's a little bit maybe inside baseball. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know anything about this, song, but what is your definition of religion that you want to have? In the um, so what would I prefer? Well, I would I mean, prefer, um, uh, in, in an ideal world, I'd like to go back to something like um, systems, systems of belief and practice that garner communities around them. And those communities have to endure over substantial periods of time. That's going to press me on those details. That's because there are going to be, there are going to be problems at the margins and so on. But there no, there's no way that this is sustainable. How is that different from culture? How is it different from culture? Um, well, uh, it's not different from culture, I would say. It implicates culture. So I don't, I have no problem with the Supreme Court taking cultural phenomena into account. I just think they have to be particular kinds of cultural phenomena with certain attributes. Um, uh, I would say a system of belief and practice. B, I would add, implicates something of the transcendent, right, of the divine. Um, C, that has attracted, that has drawn a group. A group means more than one person, for sure. Uh, it means more than two people. Um, D, that has existed over a long period of time. What is long period of time? Well, it's more than 50 years, at least. I don't know how much longer, but I would start making, if it were me to rescue this mess, I would start imposing some hard uh, uh, lines. And there are all kinds of problems with that, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Greg is gonna- uh, well, I, I wanna some... follow up on that though, yeah. a little bit. So when you talk about, uh wanting to make it more of a communal aspect rather than the individualization that uh, prevails at present. Yeah. How do you then deal with, say, a phenomenon like a, an individual who invokes a religious pacifistic viewpoint and that individual happens to be a Catholic? Yeah. Because the Catholic Church has a just war doctrine. Uh, and so in terms of that doctrine, um, war can, in fact, be justified. Using weapons to kill other people can be justified. But the church has also had a long tradition of honoring those uh, who are take a pacifistic viewpoint and, and refuse to uh, take up arms, uh, even in a just war scenario. So which one is the religious viewpoint that should be accepted. I have no problem with respect to uh, uh, granting religious exemption for a pacifist who can make a plausible claim that within the system of Catholicism, there is room for, there is a strain of, or a tradition of pacifism. No problem at all. Notice what that, that's gonna require though. It will require judges to get involved, a little bit at least, in figuring out What's at the core of this belief system? What are the various strains within some kind of range of a broad range to accommodate differences of opinion, which exist in all religious systems? Um, and to say, you know, look, if, if you're truly an outlier, right, you're, you're making a claim that is, you know, uh, I don't know, like, you know, 
the the Catholic Church requires me to have stakes in prison, right? You know, uh, as part of the core religious belief, and that's my interpretation of Scripture. And I'm, I'm sorry, that's not a plausible claim. Um, this is going to, of course, implicate issues of entanglement. But better that than a kind of collapse into utter incoherence. So I'm prepared to grant, of course, I have to, that within any system, longstanding system of religious belief and practice, there are going to be differences of opinion. But you at least have to make a showing, if you're the plaintiff, that you come within the general com compass of those of that variety. You can't, the way that it is now, uh, we, judges just say, Whatever it is, as long as you sincerely believe it, that's as far as we go. And maybe we knock out the claim because there's a government interest that's sufficiently strong on the other end, so on. Um, but in the process, you've rendered religion meaningless. It's utterly meaningless. Okay, so uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Thank you. So I am a European legal scholar. I say that every time. So one thing that surprises me uh, here in this country is that uh, religious freedom is invoked so much for causes which I would associate either with natural law or with human dignity. So I'm thinking, uh, you know, all the the marriage issues, adoption issues, abortion, contraception, the accessible health, um, affordable health act, and so on, all these things were from Catholic side were argued against invoking religious freedom. So mightn't that be a cause for this, uh, what you call liquidification of religious freedom that kind of the other sides kind of tries to defend itself by, by kind of defuminate or the inflationary use, which we have caused, you know. So it could be, although sometimes I wonder, and by the, in the same way that religious freedom has become, I agree with you, inflationary, right? It's become sort of uh, like a hypertrophic. It's just, it's too, it's too, too big. It's too much. It's, it's everything now. Um, sometimes I think that it doesn't actually get to the heart of what people care about at all when it comes to religion. Um, just to, to take current events, yeah? Um, the conflict between Israel and Palestine is a deeply, deeply religious conflict. And yet I haven't seen, I've seen almost nothing in the press, in the media, about the religious quality of the conflict. So we talk, and, or, or the, the um, ethnic cleansing going on in Nagorno-Karabakh in Armenia. That is a deeply religious conflict. It's about the extermination of a people, a Christian people. And yet, international religious freedom organizations, they can't do a thing about it because it doesn't fit into, it's not about worshiping at a, a, at a church or, 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 or proselytizing. And therefore, it's got nothing to do with religion. So I agree with you. We've got a problem of hyperinflation and we've got a problem of missing the real issues in religion um, by focusing on a kind of skewed understanding of what religion is and then inflating it to the point of incoherence. So yeah, I'm I'm down on religious freedom, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> yeah, so I had a similar, I had a lot of questions, but I had a similar question to that, to the one that um, Father Martin just, just made. Um, what implications would this have for then because if if you're if, if the goal is to sort of constrain or rein in these claims of uh religious exemption and so on and so forth um i guess one concern you might have is that then if if you can't make a claim that's tied to this very robust definition of religion which i agree with for the most part um i think you're you're correct about that um, there's just more ability or there's a reduced ability for individuals to uh, protect their own conscience rights. And so then what's the, what's, so what, you know, what, what would do that work then? Um, so I, I guess I, so it's, it's a good, great question. I don't, um, I, just to be plain, I don't mean to reform 
my, reform is not my object. Um, what happens with the next understanding of religion? I don't, I don't really see that as my uh, part of my function, um, uh, legal reform. I just want to analyze what's going on. Um, and so my object is um, look at everything that this regime misses. And most importantly, what it misses is, again, coming back to the, the these, these current events, these conflicts, it misses the idea of establishment. It misses the idea of what binds us. And when I teach constitutional law, we spend so much time on institutions, the separation of powers, right? What can the executive do? We spend no time thinking about we, what the we is of this society. Um, that's a problem, a big problem. And exemption has made it worse, much worse, because again, fundamentally, my project is an anti-liberal project. I think that the that the bases on which those first wave theorists worked and what they aimed to do and what they aimed to reestablish was wrong. It was it was it was spectacularly wrong as a shared basis for a political community. Um, so I'm more concerned, Rosemary. I'm not so concerned about individual consciences. I'm concerned about civic breakdown. I think we got plenty of protection. For individual consciences, right? We've got we've got speech, speech also hyperinflated, huge right by comparison to the way that it was at the founding. The rights of association that could do the work. I'm sure clever advocates will find other ways to recharacterize um, uh, religion in these. They already have, right? So, so think about think about um, uh, uh, you know three hundred three creative. Three three creative decided this case, not as a religion case. So plenty of protection. Again, I'm not saying that she shouldn't have been accommodated or that there shouldn't be an exemption. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what I think people like me ought to be focusing on, which is not whether she gets an exemption or not. It's the shattering of the American Republic that is done by the language of religious freedom and the, in the way that it's been interpreted. That's sort of what I'm after. Thank you for your presentation. Can you name some other scholars who you think are part of the next wave of law and religion scholarship? Sharif Gerges at Notre Dame comes to mind for me. But um, yeah, anyone you think who is the vanguard of that movement or has the potential to be in that movement? So I, I, I know and Love Sharif. I think Sharif is a tremendous scholar and an incredible mind. Um, Sharif has written, and he certainly is younger than I. Um, by too much, but by too much. <laughs> um, but but um, Sharif has written a couple of pieces, I think, that are on 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 religion um, about the 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 how does, how does he put it fragility of conscience, the weakness that try to defend religion's specialness on the basis of its um, of its weakness. From my point of view, that kind of piece is part of the problem. So Sharif is a lot smarter than I am, but that kind of right uh, apologetic defense of religion goes about things just the wrong way. Um, uh, so who would I say? Actually, one one scholar I think who is uh, so nobody, right? Nobody so far really is is doing this kind of thing. Um, one scholar that I think has gotten close is not a new scholar, but an older scholar. One of the people that I just named who retired, and that's Steve Smith. Um, so if you read if you read pieces by Steve Smith, they tend to be declinist um, and showing out showing how contemporary frameworks have failed in various ways to do the work that they thought that they that, 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 that they were supposed to be doing. Um, so I would recommend uh, his his work. Um, it remains to be seen. I mean, you know, Joel is of uh, Joel. Uh, uh, Sharif is doing the work that he needs to do, which is the work to get tenure and publishing well and so on. 
once he is unleashed on the on the law pro professoriate in the proper way after tenure, so we'll see what where he goes. I'm I'm, I'm curious about that myself. Yeah. I more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Uh, while I was speaking, I was remembering a uh, quote, and I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit from uh, I believe it was John Adams that said that our constitution was written for a moral and religious people, yeah. and it wouldn't work for people who weren't so. And I think that one of the reasons why we're seeing our whole society disintegrate is a problem because of that. Yeah, and, and when before you before you answer that, yeah, you need to leave. Yeah, please. Uh, if some of you have to be at class at one thirty, I'm looking at the clock. Yeah, yeah go. Uh, it is go. entirely appropriate for you to step up and go. <laughs> you two do have to be at class, don't you? Towards the scandal. Well, then you can but stay for the rest of that on the job. Great. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think you're right. So, and and Adams, of course. Um, was coming from many of the founders were able to just kind of tacitly assume a kind of baseline of um you know they had different views and so on but a baseline of cultural Christianity. um so when he makes a statement like that he's not he himself is not assuming any kind of thick understanding of religion but he is assuming the kind of the kind of foundation that serves as a some kind of even minimally unifying set of civic <laughs> religious connection. Um, you know, oftentimes you mention, Father, that you're you're from abroad, right? This kind of understanding is very much a European understanding, right? The common civic fundament that is sort of, uh, of course, people have different convictions and so on, whether they go to church or whether they, bring, but there is a sort of shared understanding. Uh, which, by the way, pervaded many of America's institutions, um, uh, educational institutions, uh, charitable institutions, uh, and on and on and on, political institutions. It was there, and it was it was uh, intentionally knocked down. Natural law. Natural law. Natural law. Yep. Yeah. You're concerned about the fracturing of uh, society. Polarization, which Don Berg has you know, recently written about. Yeah. Might there be another approach? And it, I think this is where Don Berg uh, is going in part to addressing that, which is to say, it's not that the claims for religious liberty are fracturing society. It's the exaggerated uh, political arguments about what those exemptions really mean uh, that is causing the fracture. And so to take you know, the Obamacare contraception mandate, yeah. Um, that was, in my view, a largely invented problem. Yeah. You know, prior to Obamacare, no one would have said one of the big problems in society is that contraception is hard to find and is expensive. It was easy to find and inexpensive. There was no great crisis about contraception. Um, and in addition, people forget this, Obama, the statute itself says nothing about contraception. This is entirely generated by administrative ruling. We have this huge fight about it. It gets all this attention. You know, the, the government files briefs with the Supreme Court about what a compelling government interest there is to make sure that everyone has access to free contraception. Eventually, the Supreme Court orders an exemption. And notice how no one even talks about it anymore. It made no difference. Um, it really didn't harm anybody to have the exemption. It was all a political um, uh, scam, essentially. And I think a lot of these debates are, including the ones about you know, wedding planners and so on. It's not as though there are plenty of other people who'd be happy to bake the cake. There isn't any real harm going on here. Political forces are exaggerating the disruption that exemptions make. So I, 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 you're right, this is Tom's argument. Um, it depends upon a division between the religious and the political, that it was, that, that is, how to put it, um, part of the sickness that I'm trying to diagnose, um, part of the wrongness. That division between the political and the religious is exactly, um, uh, is, it, is, is exactly what the, the uh, liquidation of religion has made impossible to 
to to uh, um, preserve. But but so so it doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference whether you call it political or you call it religious. It's being done in religion's name, right? The the seeking exemption, whether it's for you know providing contraception or or taking the COVID shot or whatever it is, it's it's the only way that you can get an exemption is if you call it religious. But but isn't it? Couldn't we call upon people of good faith hey, uh, from different uh, parts of the political spectrum? So you know, take your so, Well, bad, you know, terrible. Well, maybe, but 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 maybe just because we haven't tried hard enough. So <laughs> an example that Tom Berg again, I don't think it's in his book, but he often speaks about this about the Obamacare situation, is that there was a significant debate within the Obama White House uh, about whether to go in this direction, that in fact, then Vice President Biden and others said, we do not want to go in a contraception mandate. We do not want to, uh, there was no need for this, there's no need to create this political divide. It was the really pro-abortion crowd within the White House that wanted to make this a big issue because they saw this as a way to slide in eventually <laughs> the mandate for abortion wasn't really about contraception. But there were voices within the White House. They didn't prevail yeah. with President Obama, but the Vice President of the United States himself and, and, and other significant figures are saying, this is not a fight that we need to have. We can avoid this. So this is Tom's view. Tom's view is that there is just this, uh, there's a sort of uh, group of people of goodwill and you can use, of all things, you can use an appeal to religion to convince people in the middle. And I just think that that is hopelessly first wave. That is not the way that religion gets invoked. And, and, uh, so this goes back to fights that Tom and I have had, disagreements, you know, the ironic view that he takes and the appeal to Reinhold Niebuhr. And again, you know, liberal Protestant theology of the Earl of the mid 20th century, where again, I feel like that is, that's done. That's done. That you, to to say that you could appeal to religious freedom today as a unifying, a civically unifying uh, phenomenon, I just think that the evidence is just overwhelmingly to the contrary. And the other thing about Tom's proposal is, all of a sudden he comes in, then he says, "Well, you know, those COVID exemptions, those weren't really religious, right?" They're like. When you scratch the surface, they were really political. Well, then you're making my point, right? If, and why just those? Because they're on a, they're on a political side that Tom disfavors, <laughs> right? Um, all of a sudden, when, when it comes to those, all of a sudden people are in bad faith. Well, once you start making accusations of bad faith, say goodbye to the good faith middle, right? So I have a, I have a different view. Our last yeah. Murphy Institute event was I know the, the release of Tom's book. So I know we 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 did a podcast with him, and, and uh, I didn't get enough time to, to uh, poke him with questions. Anyways, I'm I'm, I'm all I'm all uh, through. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. I just want to highlight two more events um, for everyone's attention. In a couple of weeks, we'll have the Red Mass at the Basilica of St. Mary, which everyone is welcome to attend. Um, they'll only ask from the Basilica is that you RSVP on their website for lunch counts, and they make sure they have enough food um, for everyone to attend. And then our next Murphy event will feature Professor Sisk, as well as Professor Julie Jonas, and that is Hot Topics, Cool Talk on Gun Ownership. So we invite you to attend that event as well. That is Wednesday, November 15th. Um, we hope to see you at that event and all of our future Murphy events as well. Thank you for attending. Thank you.